Hello students, welcome to Schoolemy. I'm Zoave Christopher by name. I'll be taking you UTME physics past questions for last year 2020. Um, as usual, I always tell students to pay very good attention because that is the key to understanding physics. It's going to be very simple and interesting. Relax as we proceed. Now we have this uh, very simple question here. The equation x power 150 to 62 equals to y 63 and 150 plus k subscript minus one plus energy represents. Now in this question, you're required to state what kind of equation is this? We have a alpha decay, b beta decay, c gamma decay, d photon emission. Now, the correct answer to this question is beta decay. But how do you come about the fact that it's a beta decay? Now, you need to balance this equation like any other algebraic equation. Whatever there is on the left-hand side should be equal to what's on the right-hand side. Now, for the left-hand side, we have the power here to be 150. And then on the right-hand side, we have 150. Now, something is supposed to be above k here so as to balance the equation to make it balance. That is left-hand side equals to right-hand side. Now, if you add zero here, if you put zero here, 150 plus zero gives you 150, meaning that for the power, you have 150 on the left-hand side and uh, 150 on the right-hand side. And then here, this is 62. What do you need to add to 63? If you say 63 plus minus one, you'll be getting 62. So you have balanced the upper part of it and the lower part of it. So for the fact that we got zero here, it means that this is a beta equation because the symbol for beta equation is something like this. K minus one and then zero. This is beta. So that's how simple it is. Now, the second question here is another simple question. We have the eyes and steam points of a thermometer are 20 millimeters and 100 millimeters respectively. A temperature of 75 degrees Celsius corresponds to Y millimeters on the thermometer. What is Y? This is also very simple. Now, this is how we solve this. You have to show your thermometer using a line. Now, we all know that a normal thermometer, the lower fixed point is zero degrees Celsius. That is the highest point. And then the upper fixed point or steam point is 100 degrees Celsius. Now, the question is saying a temperature of 75 degrees Celsius corresponds. Okay, the ice and steam points of a thermometer are 20 millimeters and 100 millimeters respectively now a temperature of 75 degrees celsius now 75 degrees celsius should be between 0 and 100 so we have our 75 degrees celsius here let's have this as 75 degrees celsius corresponds to y now we need to know what y is now you solve it proportionately. If you're starting from the middle, you on the left-hand side, you do the same thing on the right-hand side. So from here, we're going to have 75 minus zero over 100 minus zero equals to, we started from the middle, so we'll do the same thing on this side. We have y minus 20 divided by 100 minus 20. So 75 minus zero is 75. So we have 75 over 100 equals to y minus 20, y minus 20 divided by 100 minus 20 is 80. So over 80. Then we cross multiply so that we can find our y. So we're gonna have 100 into y minus 20 equals to 75 times 80. Right? So now, 100 times y leaves us with what? 
100 y minus 100 times 20 gives us 2000 equals to 75 times 80. Now 75 times 80 is 6000. 6000. So we're now going to have 100 y to be equals to, we take minus 2,000 to the other side and add to 6,000. So we get 8,000. So finding y, we have to divide by the coefficient of y, which is 100, divide both sides by 100. And so 100 cancels 100. You're left with y equals to, these two zeros would cancel. You're left with what? 80. Now, 80 is in millimeters. It's in millimeters because on this side, it's length. So we have 80 millimeters. And the correct answer is C. That was quite easy, I guess. Now, the third question, when the yellow card is observed through a blue glass, the card would appear as, this is additive color mixing when you are adding two secondary colors to get the primary color. When the yellow card, you have yellow. You have yellow. Yellow. Plus. Blue. That gives you black. That's how you do that. Then the next question here, it says, when two objects, P and Q, are supplied with the same quantity of heat, the temperature change in P is observed to be twice that of Q. The mass of P is half that of Q. The ratio of the specific heat capacity of P to Q is, you have two objects P and Q you have P and Q supplied with the same quantity of heat now the quantity that is supplied to P here for instance let's say P is the first body Q is the second body so the quantity of heat that is supplied to P here quantity supplied up to a, a, a body of course quantity of heat supplied to a body is dependent on the mass of the body, the nature of that body, or also known as specific heat capacity, and then the temperature difference or temperature. These are the factors that affect the quantity of heat that the body can absorb. So for body P here, you're going to be having, since we have quantity of heat to be equals to mass times specific heat capacity times temperature difference, that is change in temperature. We're going to have for body P, we have mass of heat supplied to P times specific heat capacity of P times the temperature difference for P. Let's call this delta theta P. This will be equals to, because they are supplied with the same amount of heat, mass of Q, specific heat capacity of Q, and temperature difference for Q. Now, the question says, the temperature change in P, that is in P here, is observed to be twice that of Q. Twice that of Q. And then the mass of P is half that of Q. So the mass of P here is one over two the mass of Q, mass of Q, right? Times the specific capacity of P. Then the temperature difference or the temperature change in P is observed to be two times that of Q. This is the temperature difference for Q. So that of P is going to be two times that of Q. So it's two times delta Q. Temperature difference for Q. This will be equals to mass of Q 
specific capacity of Q, temperature change for Q. Now, if you look at this equation, there is something to cancel out. You have the mass of Q, cancelling mass of Q on this both sides of the equation. And so, you're going to be left with half times specific heat capacity of P times 2 times. Now, the temperature difference for Q here, these two times that are, they are two, they are, the, they are the same. So this is going to cancel this. So you're going to be having this times two equals to CQ. So now, half times two here is going to be leaving us with one because two will cancel two. So we'll be left with CP is equals to CQ. Now, they're asking you the ratio of the specific heat capacity of P to that of Q, right? So that is, um, you're dividing both sides by CQ. CQ. So this is going to be equals to CQ over CP over, um, CQ over CQ here is 1. So it's entirely one ratio one, and that is how that is solved. We have a silver spoon and a wooden spoon are both at room temperature. The silver spoon is cooler to touch because the simple reason is you have two substances here. One is wooden, the other one is silver. And if you understand what conductors and uh, insulators are, a silver spoon or silver as a material is a better conductor. It's a conductor, whereas wood is not a conductor. It's an insulator. So let's go through the options and see. A has a greater density. B can be polished. C is less absorbent material than wood. D is a better conductor of heat. And of course, the answer is D because silver is a better conductor compared to wood. The thrust due to hydrostatic pressure alone on the bottom of a fish tank, which is 60 cm by 40 cm, when the depth of water is 30 cm, is the thrust due to hydrostatic pressure. Now, you have pressure being exerted here. The thrust there is referring to force. Now, very simple. Coming from the equation for pressure, which is equal to the force, Per unit area. Of course, we are asking for they are asking us for the thrust due to hydrostatic pressure. So the thrust here is the force. If you cross multiply, it's going to be equals to the pressure times the area. What is the pressure? The pressure is not mentioned in this question at all, but you don't have to worry about that. If you recall that pressure is dependent on depth or height. It's also dependent on the nature or density of the material. And it's also dependent on gravity. From here, it means that the force or the thrust will be equal to, in place of this pressure P, you can slot in this equation. H rho G times the area. Now let's proceed. The thrust here is going to be equal to what is the height or depth here? The thrust due to hydrostatic pressure alone on the bottom of a fish tank, which is 60 by 40. This is the area. When the depth is the height now, it's 30 centimeters. Now don't forget, you need to convert this to SI units. You have the length are in centimeters, so you have you need to convert them to meters and if you want to convert centimeter to meter you divide by 100 so for the depth which is 30 is simply going to be 30 divided by 100 30 divided by 100 times the density now 
The density, since they are talking about water, the density of water is a constant. It is 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. So this is going to be times 1,000 times acceleration due to gravity is a constant. It's 10 meters per second square times the area. What is the area? The area is 60 by 40. So if you convert 60 to meters, it's going to be 60 over 100 times 40 over 100. So this is going to be equals to 30 divided by 100 is 0 0.3 times 1,000 times 10 times 0 0.6 times 0 0.4. If you press this out on your calculator accurately, you should be getting 720 Newton. That is how that trust is found. All right, we're making progress. Um, it says an object of mass, 50 grams, is suspended from the end of a spiral spring of force constant 0 0.5 Newton per meter. The body is set into simple harmonic motion with 0 0.3 meter displacement. The period of the motion is simple harmonic motion. Of course, you should know we have the period of oscillation for an oscillating mass and period of oscillation for a simple pendulum bob that has a string. The bob is attached to the string with length L. Now, it's, if it is the period for a mass that is oscillating on a spring is given by t equals to 2 pi square root of m over k, where k is the spring's constant, m is the mass suspended to the spring. Now let's take parameters that are given in the question. An object of mass 50 grams. So the mass is 50 grams, we need to convert it to Kilograms. If you want to convert 50 grams to kilograms, you're going to be having 50 grams to kilograms means 50 divided by 1,000. That gives us what? 0 0.05 kilograms. Very simple. And then the spring constant given to us here, K, is what? This is the mass. Don't forget. So K here is equal to what? 0 0.5 Newton per meter. And then the displacement is given to us with a displacement of 0 0.3 meters. Let's say the displacement is uh, y equals to 0 0.3 meters. The question is asking us for the period. This is just what we need. So T here is going to be equals to 2 pi square root of the mass 0 0.05 divided by k 0 0.5 that's going to be equals to 2 pi 2 pi square root of 0 0.05 divided by 0 0.5 0 0.05 divided by 0 0.5 gives us 0 0.1 so that's going to be equals to 2 pi times the square root of 0.1 is going to be equal to what? Square root of 0 0.1 is 0 0.3162. Now, don't forget the value of pi is a constant is 3.142 times 0 0.3162. So, that put together should give you 1.99 seconds approximately so that's how that is solved too very simple number eight <clears throat> if 21 grams of alcohol of density 0.7 grams per cm cube is mixed with 10 grams of water what would be the density of the resulting mixture you have two substances here. You have alcohol and water put together. They're asking you for the density of the mixture. 
Of course, that's a mixture, water and uh, alcohol, they are a mixture. All right. Now, there are some facts that you need to know about this question. Let 21 grams of alcohol, let the mass of alcohol, let's put it as mass of alcohol is equal to 21 grams, right? And then the density of alcohol, density. Density is denoted with symbol rho. It stands for density. Let the density of alcohol be equals to 0 0.7 grams per cm cube. Then it's mixed with 10 grams of water. So we got mass of water to be equals to 10 grams. What would be the density of the resulting mixture? So let the, de let the mixture, let's put, represent mixture with uh, M. Let's mixture equals to M. So wherever you see um, M here, you are referring to what? Mixture. So now the volume of the mixture in the first place, Vm, will be equals to the volume of alcohol plus the volume of water. We are not given the volume of alcohol or volume of water in this problem, but we do, we do know that there is a relation for density, mass, and volume. So recall that density is equal to what? Mass over volume. Now, if we want to find out the volume of this mixture, alcohol and water, we need to find, make V the subject of formula here. Making V the subject of formula, first of all, you cross multiply. You're having rho V equals to M means that V on its own is going to be equals to what? M over density. M over density. Now, density. The volume of the mixture is going to be the mass of the mixture divided by divided by mass of the mixture divided by the density of the mixture, which is what we're looking for, equals to volume of alcohol is going to be mass of alcohol divided by density of alcohol plus volume of water will be mass of water divided by density of water our equation is set we're left with substitution the mass of the mixture very simple is simply going to be the mass of alcohol plus mass of water we have 20 grams of alcohol 10 grams of water you add the two masses together, mass is a constant. You're going to have 21 plus 10, that is 31, divided by the density of the mixture, which is our interest, equals to the mass of alcohol is given to us as 21, right? Divided by density of alcohol is 0 0.7 plus the mass of water is given to us as 10 grams divided by the density of water. The density of water is not given in this problem, but of course, you should be familiar with the density of water. It is 1,000 kilograms per meter cube, which is equivalent to 1 gram per centimeter cube. So we just put 1 here. Now, we need to solve this equation to find our, our density of mixture. Now, to deal with these fractions, you take LCM. LCM of 0 0.7 and 1 is 0 0.7. So let's continue on this side. Uh, so we're going to have um, we're going to have 31 divided by density of mixture to be equals to 0 0.7. Now, 0 0.7 divided by 0 0.7 is 1. 1 times 21 is 21. Plus 0 
divided by 1 is 0 0.7 times 10 is 7. So we have 31 divided by density of mixture to be equals to 21 plus 7 is 28 divided by what? 0 0.7. What's next to be done is you cross multiply and divide. So if you cross multiply density of this times 28, that is 28 density. So it's going to be equals to density of the mixture equals to equals to density of mixture equals to 31 times 0 0.7 divided by 28. So that gives you 31 times 0 0.7. 31 times 0.7 is 21.7. So 21.7 divided by 28. That gives us 0 0.775 which is in what? Grams per cm cube. So approximately that's going to be giving us what? 0 0.78. Approximately 0 0.780 grams per cm cube. So the correct answer there is A, looking at us. Okay, we're making progress. Number nine, two masses, 50 grams and 70 grams are suspended from the respective ends of a light meter rule. The center of gravity of the system is the center of gravity of the system. You have two masses. Now, it's a meter rule. So you have to just draw a meter rule so that you can understand what you're doing. Is 100 centimeters, right? So this is the zero end, and then this is the 100 cm. You have two masses, 50 grams, and 70 suspended from both ends. So let's say at this end, you have 50 grams. And then at this end, you have 70 grams. Now, the center of gravity of the system is, of course, you know what center of gravity is. It's the point on the body where its entire mass appears to be concentrated, regardless of its orientation. For instance, if you want to take my center of gravity, you can suspend me on a pin or a pole. Wherever I'm going to stay stably on the pole, that is where my center of gravity is. And every object has a constant center of gravity. For a uniform meter rule, the center of gravity is supposed to be at the midpoint. That is, if it is a perfectly uniform meter rule. Now, let's see to that. In any case, we expect that the center of gravity with these masses, let's say it should be at the point X. X. Let's say that is where it balances. Right? Now, we need to find what X is. Since X, we assumed it to be the center of gravity. What we need to do is we need to take um, the clockwise moment about point X and anticlockwise moment about the same point. So where are the clockwise moments? The clockwise moments are those forces that tend to make this meter rule move in the same direction as the direction of the clock. Now, this is the direction of the clock, right? So this force here constitutes the clockwise, right? Whereas these 50 grams would constitute anti-clockwise, anti-clockwise. Good. Or combating um, the distances to meters. Work with what you have. Because since you're going to be having two things on the left and right hand side, they will cancel out. Let's see how it goes. Now, from the principle of moment, the sum of clockwise moments about a fixed point is equal to the sum of anticlockwise moments about the same point. Now, for the clockwise moment here, uh, anticlockwise moment on my left-hand side, I have 
50 times x because the perpendicular distance of 50 from x is the perpendicular distance of 50 from the fixed point or the pivot is x from 0 to x so we're going to be having 50 times x equals to for the clockwise moment i have 70 grams times the perpendicular distance of this 70 from this same point which is uh, the pivot or the fixed point if this point from 0 to this point is x and from 0 to this point is 100 if we want to know this short distance between x and 100 we just take the difference so it's going to be 100 minus x our mission is to find x so we got 50x equals to 70 times 100 is 7000 7000 minus 70x collect like terms if you take minus 70 to the left hand side you get 50x plus 70x 50x plus 70x gives us 120x equals to 7000 so we divide both sides by 120 120 so it means that x it implies that x equals to what 7000 divided by 120 will give you 58.3 centimeters and that's the center of gravity of the system the transformer which can produce 10 volts from a 240 volts ac supply has an efficiency of 60 percent if the current in the secondary winding coil is 15 amperes the current in the primary coil is what is a transformer of course if you understand what a transformer is the transformer is meant to step up voltage or step it down if it is stepping up it's simply referred to as step up transformer if it is stepping down or reducing it it's a step down transformer now however this question is asking us to find the current in the primary coil okay now very importantly we need to understand what efficiency is now, for instance, if you want to find efficiency, the formula for efficiency, for instance, is going to be the power output. Let's put power output as PO divided by the power input. Let's put it as P input times 100%. Now, power or electrical power is given by IV, if you remember this formula very well. So the efficiency can now be put as the power output. The output is usually on the secondary coil. Let me draw a transformer very quickly here. If this is a transformer, you can have coils here to be the primary. This is the primary, and then you have another tones here. We'll, let's say this is the secondary this is the output for instance then on the primary here is where the input right on this diagram this is a transformer now since p is equals to iv the power output which is going to be on the secondary on the secondary here is the primary here is the secondary right where you have the output so power output is going to be on the secondary coil. So the power on the output or secondary coil is going to be equals to I secondary times V secondary divided by, for the primary, you have I primary times V primary times 100 percent the efficiency is already given to you the efficiency you are told is 60 percent so substituting efficiency will be 60 equals to 
the current on the secondary. A transformer which can produce 10 volts from a 240. Now, from a 240, that is the input. The input is 240, but the output is what? 10 volts, which is going to be on the secondary. So, the, um, this is going to be, if you're collecting light ends here, you have Vs is going to be equals to what? 10 volts. Then, Vp is going to be 240 volts. The efficiency is 60%. If the current in the secondary winding coil is 50, that is I S is 50 amperes. You are looking for the current in the primary coil, that is I P is a question. Substitute. Efficiency is 60 equals to IS is 15 times VS is 10 times 100. Don't forget. Divided by IP is what you're looking for. IP times VP. That is the voltage the primary is what? 240. Okay. Now we can reduce this equation and then cross multiply. If we're reducing this equation, this zero would cancel zero here. So that in the numerator we have 10 times 10 times 15. So 10 times 10 is 100. And then 100 times 15. That is 1,500. So we got 60 equals to 1,500 divided by 24 IP. Right? So now we cross multiply. We will have 60 times 24. 60 times 24. We have 1,440. So we have 1,440 IP equals to 1,500. So your IP is equals to 1,500 divided by 1,440. So that's going to be equals to what? 1,500 divided by 1,440. That's going to be giving us 1.042 amperes. Or approximately 1.04 amperes as required. And that's how that is solved. Okay, the acceleration due to gravity dash increases with increasing altitude, decreases with increasing altitude, increases with an increase in the square of the altitude, is not affected by the altitude. Well, looking at this, you know that acceleration due to gravity is maximum on the Earth's surface, all right? So as you are ascending, it should decrease. So going by that, the correct answer is B. Acceleration due to gravity decreases with what? Increasing altitude. Since it is highest on the surface of the Earth and it's approximately um, 10 meters per second square. So as you ascend or increase in altitude, it should uh, decrease. A boy of mass M suspended from a, sp from a spring is put into simple harmonic motion. If the motion has amplitude A and the spring constant K, the maximum potential energy of the mass is maximum potential energy. Now, the energy that is possessed by an elastic spring, of course, is elastic potential energy. And um, 
the elastic potential energy of an elastic spring is given by half q y squared where y there is the displacement of the spring sometimes you can put e there that is the extension where you're taking the different um, lengths of the spring when it's oscillating now since you're talking about and uh, since they are asking is put into simple harmonic motion if the motion has amplitude a that is maximum displacement it means that y is equal to what a that is maximum displacement it therefore means that potential energy is equal to what half k in place of y you now put a a squared it's very simple that means that the correct answer you got we have k a we have 0 0.5 k a squared so that's the correct answer the answer is b 0 0.5 k a squared Another problem on transformer, a transformer connected to a 240 volt AC source has 500 turns in its primary winding and 25 turns in its secondary winding. Calculate the EMF induced in the secondary winding. For you to solve this problem appropriately, you already should know how the transformer looks. Now, if this is the primary and this is the secondary, for instance. Very importantly, the number of turns in the transformer is directly proportional to the EMF that can be produced or that can be induced. The more the turns, the more the EMF and correspondingly the current that can be produced in that transformer. Now, if that's the case, you can simply say, okay, number of turns is directly proportional to what? To the voltage, right? Or EMF that can be induced. It's directly proportional to this. Now, this is the trick. You have N would be equals to, if you're changing this proportionality sign to equality sign, you introduce a constant, let's say K. So we got K V. So that from here, N over V is equals to what? K. This is from where you can derive your formula to solve this problem from the principle of conservation. The number of turns on the primary divided by the voltage on the primary will be equal to number of turns on the secondary divided by the voltage on the secondary. And the question is asking us to calculate the EMF induced in the secondary. So we make Vs the subject of formula by cross multiplying. And if we do that, MP times this, we got um mp vs equals to nsvp nsvp now we want to make vs the subject of formula so vs is going to be equals to nsvp divided by np we now substitute appropriately Okay, from the question, we can get everything that we need. The number of turns on the secondary. The transformer connected to a 240 volt source has 500 turns in its primary. So, the uh, number of um, turns in the primary is, uh, is 500 turns, and then 25 turns in the secondary. That is, NS is 25 times the voltage in the primary is connected to a 240 volt AC source. That is the source, the primary times 240 divided by the number of tons in the primary. It says it has 500 tons in its primary. So that's 500. So that's going to be equals to 25 times 240. 25 times 240. You get 6,000. 6,000 divided by 500. If you do that accurately, you should be having 12, 12 volts. Very simple, right? That was quite easy.
when the brakes in the car are applied, the frictional force on the tires dash. What's the essence of applying brakes in a car? Is to stop the car or to bring the car to a halt when it's in motion. So A is a disadvantage because it is in the direction of the motion of the car. That's not true. It's a disadvantage because it is in the opposite direction of the motion of the car. No. It is an advantage because it's in the direction of the motion of the car. It's an advantage because it is in the opposite direction of the motion of the car. Now, if at all the brakes are meant to bring the car to a stop, going by that fact, it's a, it's a disadvantage because it is in the opposite direction of the motion of the car. No, it's an advantage because it is in the direction of the motion of the car. No, it's an advantage because it is in the direction opposite direction of the motion of the car and that's the correct answer the correct answer is d because if the frictional force is in the um is acting in opposite direction to the motion of the car that is when it will bring it will oppose the motion of the car and then bring it to a halt so it becomes an advantage d is the correct option then number 15 a solid weight a solid weighs 10 newton in air 6 newton when fully immersed in water and 7 newton when fully immersed in a liquid x calculate the relative density of the liquid now the relative density here of the liquid um let let's assume that the weight in a equals to w1 as the weight of the body of the solid in air, let it be W1. And now a solid weighs 10 Newton in air. So it means W1 is equal to what? 10 Newtons. Six Newton when fully immersed in water. So let the weight in water, let it be W2. And it's what? Six Newton. At 7 Newton when fully immersed in a liquid, let the weight in a liquid X, let it be what? W3. W3 is 7 Newton. Question is calculate the relative density of the liquid. Relative density RD of the liquid X is going to be equal to the upthrust of that solid in the liquid X divided by the upthrust of that solid in water. So it's going to be uh, upthrust in X divided by upthrust in water. So what is upthrust? Upthrust is weight in air minus weight in a liquid or weight in water, as the case may be. So the upthrust of that solid in X is going to be the weight of the solid in air, W1, minus the weight of the solid in X. And the weight in X is what? Is W3 divided by Uptrust in water is going to be the weight in air, W1, minus the weight in water. And the weight in water is W2. So substituting, W1 is 10 minus W3 is 7. Divided by W1 again is 10 minus W2 is 6. That becomes 10 minus 7 is 3. 10 minus 6 is 4. So the answer is what? 3 over 4. 3 over 4, which is C. 3 over 4 is the correct answer.
right? Okay, we're making progress. We have a nail is pulled from a wall with a string tied to the nail. If the string is inclined at an angle of 30 degrees to the wall and the tension in the string is 50 Newton, the effective force used in pulling the nail is. Now, it's very important using diagrams to understand physics problems because when you're making use of a diagram, it gives you a clear picture of the problem. And then from there, you derive the principle behind that problem. And that is how you solve that problem very easily. Now, let's take uh, a diagram for this problem. It says a nail is pulled from a wall. So let's represent our wall like this. This is our wall. And um, this is a wall. So on this wall, we have a nail here. Let's have this to be a nail. Let's have this to be a nail. It's right inside the wall, like this. And then if the string is inclined at an angle of 30 degrees to the wall. If this is the wall, with respect to the wall, you have a string attached like this. And this is the end from where you're pulling. You grab it from here and you're pulling. And the angle made with the wall is uh, 30 degrees. All right, fantastic. Now the tension in the string is, that is the strain or the tensional force experienced in the string here is 50 Newton. The effective force used in pulling the nail is, the effective force used in pulling the nail is. Now the aim of pulling this nail is to bring it out of the wall. Now, since the string is at a slant position, it is in between the vertical, the horizontal force, and the vertical force. Now, the force that would effectively bring this nail out of the wall must be acting in this direction. That is the x direction. Now, let that force be f. So, we need to find um, what f is. Now, if we draw a parallel to the wall, it's going to be a line here. Already, this is giving us a right angle to triangle. So this is the right angle here. Now, this is 30 degrees. We need to know what this is. The whole of this angle is 90 degrees. So if here is 30, here is 60 automatically. All right. So uh, solving from the right angle triangle, um, the relationship, the trigonometric relationship is given by cosine because cosine of 60 degrees is going to be equals to f is an adjacent force divided by the hypotenuse which is what 50 if you cross multiply f will now be equals to 50 cos 60 degrees so that's going to be 50 times cos 60 degrees whether from your calculator or from special triangles you're going to be having it to be half. So 50 times half equals to what? 25 Newton. That was easy as well. So the answer is A, 25 Newton. We have, when the temperature of liquid increases, its surface tension dash. A decreases, B increases, C remains constant, D increases, then decreases. Now, if you want to correct surface tension, you know what surface tension is? The property of a liquid to behave as if it were an elastic skin. That's what surface tension is. Now, in order to reduce surface tension, apart from um, addition of detergents to it, which is one method of reducing uh, surface tension, another method is by what? Boiling. So when you boil it, what happens to the temperature? It increases. So as the question is asking, when the temperature of liquid increases, what happens to the surface tension? It decreases. So the correct answer is what? E, it decreases, right? Okay, number 18. Uh, number 18 says, a gas at a volume of V0 in a container at pressure P0 is compressed to one-fifth of its volume. What would be its pressure if the magnitude of its original temperature T is constant? Of course, um, 
If they say that the temperature is constant from the general gas law P1, V1 over T1 equals to P2, V2 over T2. Since you are told that the temperature is constant, it means temperature does not change. That leaves you with what? P1, V1 equals to what? P2, V2. Now, let's go through the question and see how we can solve it. There's a gas at a volume of V0. That is the initial volume. V1 is what? V0. In a container at pressure P0. So it means P1 is what? P0. V1 is what? V0 equals to. Let's get to P2. Now, what would be its pressure? That is the second pressure, P2, is what we're looking for. Let's put it P2 times. What would be its pressure if the magnitude of its original temperature remains uh, constant? Now, the, the, the volume of the gas is compressed to one-fifth of its original volume. So V2 here would be equal to 1, one over 5 V not because the initial volume was v naught so when it's compressed to one fifth it becomes um, v2 becomes one over five v naught so we're looking for p2 here so we just cancel out v naught cancels v naught so you're left with what p naught equals to p2 times one over five so you now um make p2 the subject of formula p2 is going to be equals to what it's going to be p naught divided by one over what five that's going to be what five p naught as required that was quite easy too so the correct answer is what d five p naught the fundamental frequency of vibration of a sonometer wire may be halved by, how do we have it? A, doubling the length of the wire. B, doubling the mass of the wire. C, reducing the tension by half. D, reducing the absolute temperature. What's the relationship between the frequency and length of the wire? Frequency is inversely proportional to the length, right? So the fundamental frequency of vibration of centimeter may be halved by how do you have it this relationship means that if the frequency is 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 doubled the length will be what halved if the length is half the frequency is doubled so for you to have um for you to have the frequency you need to what double the length have the frequency for you to have a half frequency what do you do to the length double it all right this relationship means if f is increasing l is decreasing if l is increasing f is increasing so the correct option there is option a doubling the length of the wire then the electromagnetic waves that are sensitive to temperature changes are a ultraviolet rays b gamma rays c infrared rays D X rays. Ultraviolet rays, of course, come from the sun. Those are the rays that come in form of uh, uh, solar solar rays that cause skin burn. Then gamma rays, infrared rays. Infrared rays come from sources of heat, like heat from walls or from heated bodies. Now. The electromagnetic waves that are sensitive to temperature, that is affected by temperature, of course, they are what? Infrared rays. And that brings us to the end of our class for today. I hope it was an interesting one. I hope to see your comments or questions if there are any. You can also check on Scudemy for links to my courses on UTME and SSC on their portal. Bye for now. Thank you.